chance to file in here. Hello, everybody. Just giving people a chance to get connected to audio before uh, before we start going through with introductions. Give it about another 30 seconds here. All right. So thanks uh, everybody for joining us today for another ACRO webinar. This one on the exciting world of the electronic exchange of student transcripts. Uh, before we get started with introductions, I uh, just wanted to cover a few quick logistics. This is uh, very much probably familiar to all of you, uh, except that it's Zoom webinar instead of Zoom meeting. So your cameras and your microphones are disabled by default, so you don't have to worry about interrupting anybody on the call. Uh, and as such, the primary modes for interaction with uh, either us as the host, if you have technical issues, or with the panelists themselves for content questions is going to be the chat and the Q&A. Uh, for any question related to what's being presented, we're going to ask that you use the Q&A. You can ask those questions anonymously. You can upload existing questions and even add your own comments to those. Uh, and it makes it much easier for us to track what's been asked and what's been answered and we'll get to those at the end of the actual presentation. Uh, and then for any kind of side discussion or private chats, anything like that, you can uh, use the chat functionality. Uh, if you uh, want everybody to see your message, then make sure you select all panelists and attendees from that drop down there. Otherwise, it's by default going to go to just the panelists and uh, the ACRO hosts themselves. Uh, so now that we have some of the technical stuff out of the way, um, Welcome to today's uh, presentation on considerations on the best practices in the electronic exchange of student transcripts uh, using PDF, EDI, XML, and so on. And this is presented by some esteemed uh, members and veterans of our Speedy Committee here. So I know we have Matt Bemis uh, as Associate Registrar at the University of Southern California. Uh, we have Jeff Elliott, who is the I think it's the data warehouse uh, enterprise manager um, at the University of Missouri system. And then we have Doug Holmes, who is the manager of the Ontario University's Application Center for eTranscripts. So without further ado, I want to hand it off to Doug Holmes. Great. Thanks, Mike. Hi, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for attending the webinar today. Um, so Jeff, Matt, and myself are all members of ACRO Speedy Committee. So we are a professional development committee of ACRO. Um, fellow members of ACRO with you and here to serve and help you with any questions that you may have and implementing and how to get started around this whole area of electronic data exchange. So thank you for coming today. And as Mike mentioned, we'll be happy to take questions that you um, enter throughout the session um, towards the end of the presentation today. And also to encourage you for next week, there's a part two to this session. Um, if you haven't registered yet, I'd encourage you to check the, the ACRO website for details about next week's follow-up as a roundtable discussion. Um, we're hoping today that we'll open up a bunch of questions um, and maybe further details that you'd like us to um, talk about for you next week and discuss amongst yourselves. And so that's an opportunity next week to do that on part two. Uh, so just a, a brief agenda for you today. A lot of our slides will be talking about each of this content as we, as we go along, looking at the three major formats, PDF, EDI, and XML for doing standardized transcript exchange. And that standard word is one of the key elements here is talking and the standard exchange method is sort of like a common language so that our systems can share information and exchange data and business documents that we need in higher ed with each other in that common language to understand and interpret the data. Uh, and we'll be talking about advantages for student mobility and transferability of credits and student credentials, uh, removing student barriers or barriers to students access um, and a, a focus on business continuity for our admissions and records offices in these days. Um, using electronic data exchange and how you can further automate processes and gain efficiencies as we talk through the various formats. And then towards the end of the presentation, we'll have a number of additional <coughs> resources and information links um, that you'll find helpful as you look to research which option may fit well for you and actually getting started on an implementation. And with that, I'll turn things over to Matt for our first topic. Hi, everybody. I'm Matt. Uh, I've, I've been with USC for about 25 years and uh, happy to join you today. Uh, I'm reminded we're in week 29 of our lockdown. Um, so I hope all of you are weathering the storm as well as me and my staff. So it's been an interesting time. 
uh, we, we really are focusing on business continuity as part of the discussion here. And, and to kick that off, we're going to talk about PDFs and why they're important. And if you're not sending PDFs, why you should probably consider doing so, uh, probably with one of the vendors in the space. Um, but so, so the history of the PDF, I think if I had to give a dollar to everybody on this webinar who didn't know what a PDF was, I, I probably wouldn't need to break a $5 bill. Mm -hmm. So I think it's pretty, uh, you know, it's, it's the ubiquitous PDF. It's everywhere. Uh, the, the, the actual format was um, released by Adobe in 1993. It was a, a proprietary standard for a long period of time. You needed to uh, purchase a reader to engage it or read it or create it. Uh, that became an open standard in 2008. We did put here that they um, cooperated with the, uh, with the ISO standards committee to make sure they had data that was um, um, standardized. We put that there because if, if any of you, if, if we have technology people on the call, if you, if you Wikipedia PDF, it'll give you a lot of good information about just how they built this standard. It was really built very smartly and, and really with a very forward, uh, forward view. So do check that out. I, I, I was reminded that um, the year that they released this as an open standard was the year that USC released uh, PDF transcripts. We were one of the first clients of Avow. Those of you who've been around long enough may know them. Um, and so, I, you know, that, so, so with the open standard, we were, you know, right out of the gate coming behind them so that uh, USC could issue those uh, PDF uh, transcripts. Uh, I do want to draw attention that this is not data per se. This is, a, this is an image. This is a picture of the data. Uh, that, that is uh, really a limitation of sorts for those of us who consume data. Uh, Jeff and Doug are going to talk about um, better standards where you can exchange data in a way that's machine consumable, but PDF is still a good start. So if you are in lockdown here and you have to go to campus to print transcripts, uh, PDF is your, is your very first step to get, uh, get moving. And really what this is, is this is taking your a data set extract from your student information system and spooling it as a PDF, really using your print program that you use to print uh, physical transcripts. That's pretty much what vendors use to get started here. Um, so next slide. So, so, open, um, so receiving, institutions have to determine how to get the data into their system. So um, the first step efforts generally are to print the, print the PDF, um, load the PDF manually, image the PDF, link it to your student information system. That's kind of a first step. Um, that's, a, that's a very much a, um, a, what most institutions start with. Uh, if you get a little more sophisticated, you learn how to dynamically link it to your image viewer on the fly. Uh, authentication is a big part of the PDA, PDF uh, transaction set. You have to know that it's coming from an authorized source and it hasn't been tampered with, it's secure. And provided, provided that uh, you have encryption, you can, you can verify the source and its authenticity. Uh, PDFs can have attachments uh, such as XML or EDI. Um, I think AMCAS is one of the organizations right now that's trying to uh, process metadata with PDFs such that they have the image in addition to the physical uh, machine data that can link it to the student that's part of that, uh, tra that's part of that transaction. Uh, there are some challenges with PDF transcripts. Um, so students often um, have an email address to send the PDF to and sometimes they get it right, sometimes they get it wrong. Sometimes even when it's right, it goes to spam filters. Uh, those of you who are on the business end of responding to requests uh, for information on why the PDF wasn't delivered successfully, uh, these are very common issues. And so often it's reminding the recipients that uh, to uh, modify their spam filters. So it's coming from a certain source, a certain vendor. Uh, it's not going into a spam or a trash file. Um, the features of each of these documents, it's really robust. You can determine uh, document management um, uh, up to the number of times a PDF can be opened, how long it's stored, how long it can be um, considered official, and you can rescind the document. You can actually retract it and, and make it um, and remove the security feature that makes it valid. Um, so recipients, how they, how they uh, p this is an interesting story. So do you accept a PDF as an institution or an employer? I mentioned to you that USC went live in 2008 with PDFs. And so we did it without much fanfare. Um, we, you know, it was a soft rollout. It was on our transcript service web, web page as an option. And uh, you know, within two hours of releasing it, we had measurable volume. Uh, students, alums were taking advantage of it. Two weeks later, one of our undergraduate students who, uh, who re was a recent graduate was applying to a graduate program. As part of the requirements for application, they had to submit a, a, a USC transcript. That was part of the application. And our admissions office, when they received it, responded that USC does not accept PDF transcripts. So it really is a, um, 
uh, you know, the, the, the adoption of this has gone from no way, we're not, we're not accepting this, we're, you know, we're, we're registrars, we're looking for paper transcripts to absolute adoption across the board now. Um, it was, it's absolutely um, a, a standard out there. And in fact, what we're going to talk about in a bit is how PDF has somewhat cannibalized the EDI and XML efforts going, uh, going, going on where some of the schools have stopped sending EDI or XML data uh, and are sending only PDF. And that's a real problem for institutions who have relied on the data coming in. Transcript benefits. Um, the, um, so basically, if you were to um, sign up with one of the uh, vendors in this space, uh, they have very clever people in their artwork department who can very closely mirror the very look and feel of your transcript. They, come real, they, do, they do a really good job of that. Uh, in fact, they do such a good job that they often provide the, the printing and mailing of paper transcripts now as a service. So uh, they, they've come a long way with that. Um, the, again, document management rights allow you to put watermarks. Um, they allow you to have um, other features that um, are, uh, are, 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 are desired as part of your transactions. Um, this is really quick and easy for vendors in the space to come up to speed with your data. Now there are APIs that um, that are, need to be negotiated uh, with your, with your very with the very student information systems. But once you're up, it's pretty much uh, one and done. So um, you know, getting off the blocks is the hardest part. Uh, determining the a vendor, selecting the vendor, uh, all all the vendors have their have their uh, strengths. Um, so absolutely. And what you'll find is there's a real cost reduction to this. So the cost of Printing a, a paper transcript is the stock, the envelope, the staff member, the toner, um, the the postage service. Uh, this is really um, very very cost efficient. It's it's very inexpensive to produce a PDF. In fact, we charge more for our paper transcript than we do our PDF, just to encourage students to request the PDF. Uh, implementation is quick, as I mentioned, and there's very little um, need for IT support on your side once the vendor understands your files, understands how to build this, and has the API established. I think we have a sample PDF here that's gonna show you what this looks like from a receiver, a consumer point of view. You'll see that this has a, um, this, is, this is for the University of Colorado Boulder, and uh, it had this, if we were looking at a true PDF with a, with a digital signature, you would see a, a digital, um, of, um, signature around it showing that it is, uh, it is a secure uh, official document. So again, but this is artwork created by a vendor that, that is a mirror image of the paper transcript. Uh, sending best practices. Um, certainly you, you want to utilize security. We call this the blue ribbon because that's what it looks like. There's a blue ribbon around the document. It does have to the side of it a digital signature. Um, it could have a watermark background. That's all up to the, in, all up to the institution. And, and it could or could not have a document expiration. I'll give you a sample of, 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 of something not to do. <laughs> um, we put a 30-day window on our PDFs originally. And what that means is the receiver would have 30 days to view it, consume it, print it, do whatever they want to do with it. But at the end of the 30 days, it turned into a pumpkin. <laughs> and so the problem with that is if you were a, an admissions office and you were going back to look at that file, that, that transcript is no longer there. That transcript is no longer valid. So I think most schools from 2008 moving forward really went to a, a, a very strong uh, relaxing of document management rights. It's kind of like the, the piece of paper doesn't um, burn up in 30 days, so why should the PDF kind of thing? So, um, so but document expiration is, is something that you, you will have to consider when, uh, when rolling this out. Um, some other best practices, uh, vendor networks, um, multiple step authentic authentic authentication. What that means is, that are there multiple steps to view the, the secure document? Um, some, um, some vendors send the PDF in one file and a password in, I'm sorry, PDF in one email and a password in a second email, just so that they can't be um, uh, hijacked and, uh, and, and FERPA information is shared. Uh, again, that's different vendors do different things. I will say that, um, when we built this slide, we talked about the number of vendors in the space being a, a, a good size. Uh, right now, that's not the case. We have really winnowed down to two major service providers here. Um, I think that should be a concern for higher education. You know, we don't really have the competition that drove the uh, adoption and the cost, uh, the effective cost of this. So we're, we're, it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next few years if anybody else gets into that space. Um, and we, get, we put this don't lock it down so tight that receiving institutions cannot process it. Absolutely. 
um, best practices continued. Uh, like we mentioned that you're gonna have to do something with the PDF data, how you load it into your student information system. Uh, you can do it manually. There are companies out there that will um, allow you to do um, optical character recognition. What they do is they build templates that overlay the PDF and they screen scrape and they use EDI or XML data, data translations to get it into your student information system. But the reality is many institutions right now simply print these and, and key the data in. It's not really what you want to do. You know, we put here this coordinate with primary trading partners as a best option. And I want to explain that a little bit. Um, there, this is all about a, a trusted source. You're getting a PDF from a trusted source. The reason vendors blue ribbon it is so that you can verify it has not been tampered with. Um, but if you have a trusted source that's sending you PDFs uh, that you can reliably um, consider official, and I'll give you an example of that, um, you, can, you can actually create networks where you are exchanging without blue ribboning and, and having the cost of that. We have over 800 students a year uh, that take advantage of our overseas studies programs. Um, well, okay, uh, maybe not right now, <laughs> but, um, but, the, uh, but, but the, the complication with that is it takes a long time to get the official transcripts back from those schools. It's just, the, the, it's just how they do business. So we have started to accept um, PDFs from known email addresses for those students so that we can process their overseas studies work in a timely manner. Um, often they need that work to clear prerequisites or for graduation or other needs. And so we have set up um, um, partner, trading partners, where they're sending the PDFs that have not been blue ribboned. And that, that's been just a necessary business practice. So absolutely. So do PDFs uh, save time and money? Absolutely. For all the reasons I've talked about, not using postage, not using um, secure stock, not using toner. Um, Absolutely, you're going to you're going to reduce time. Uh, you know, for the student who needs a rush transcript, we know what that means. Someone has to be in the office printing it and labeling it and sending it out. Maybe FedEx FedExing it. Um, PDFs literally can go out within you know a 10 minute transaction with however often your system wakes up and checks for um, checks for um, uh, activity orders. So, and again, we've priced this to where the PDF is a far more attractive option. Um, for, for, for all the reasons I've stated. It really is, uh, it really is um, uh, an advantage to everyone in the system to get a PDF versus a paper transcript. So we put a sample here about um, um, do PDF transcripts save time and money? Uh, this is more about COVID right now. This next slide here is more about COVID. Um, paper, what are you gonna do with paper when you can't get it? <laughs> right now we have to go to campus every two weeks and, and go to the mail services and, and find our, you know, we're. We're, we're, we have the Santa bag of, of transcripts that we take to our office and, and someone loads them off campus. So, you know, paper, this paper illustrates the need of business continuity not working for us. Uh, there are some um, schools out there that um, send the EDI, but uh, they're sending paper still because um, some, some schools are not in their various networks for consuming that. Uh, but this really does illustrate the need for EDI and XML, the consideration of EDI and XML. I will tell you that USC brought up EDI in 2010, and we never looked back. We get 15,000 EDI transactions a year, both for prior degree verifications for our international students and all of the community colleges in California. And it was, a, you know, overnight, we went from having four people having the key in data to repurposing those jobs, repurposing those jobs. So, uh, and it's not just, a, a ma as Doug's going to explain, it's not just a matter of efficiency. This is a matter of the, the elimination of fraud and the, the improvement of customer service and business continuity. I think that's a good um, segue. But I will also, I would also like to say, we're going to give you a link at the end of the presentation to a PDF best practices guide that the Speedy Committee um, authored um, several years ago. Um, I think that, is that guide gonna be there, Doug? Yes, it is. Yeah, so you'll have that as well. And it kind of gives some stats about what you should and should not do, or what works well, and what, what, you know, what, what you, the vagaries of, of, of PDF uh, data exchange. So, yeah, thank you. Great, thanks, Matt. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm Doug Holmes, uh, the manager of eTranscripts at the Ontario University's Application Center in Ontario, Canada, uh, and a member of Speedy Committee with Matt and Jeff, as I mentioned at the beginning. So I'll be talking with you today about the EDI data format. So moving now from PDF into our first data file format for Exchange. Um, and so there'll be a few slides that I'll just briefly go through for you, uh, but you will be able to get a copy of these slide decks at the very end if you want to have the full information. This EDI glossary is one example. There's a lot of acronyms that we throw around uh, and sometimes in our presentation, it's helpful to have a glossary so you know 
which group is being talked about. Several standards bodies have been involved over the years and so on. Um, and even sort of what SPEEDY stands for. And um, so there'll be some information here for you and a little bit of a history on the next slide to just give you some of the flow, similar to how Matt described the evolution for PDF, uh, the EDI data format, and I'll show you some samples soon of what the file would actually look like and talk around benefits of using the, the file, um, data file over a PDF document. It actually came to, to be in higher education sort of as a chance meeting at an acro annual in the late 1980s when some folks from Florida and some folks from Texas who had started doing some dabbling with sharing data with, within their state, both came to present at acro annual and met with each other and some conversations that started, this could be bigger than just within states. And they actually went through ACRO and worked with several standards groups. And within a couple of years had a standard that was published to start exchanging a nationally approved standard um, through ANSI, the American National Standards Institute. Uh, and quickly it grew into be the North American de facto standard for both the US and Canada. Um, and has been used ever since uh, by many hundreds of schools across North America um, for efficiently trading um, data so that we're sending data and being able to receive and parse and use the data. Uh, and we'll have some stats that you can see uh, towards the end of this presentation as well that give you an idea of the volume of data that is actually being sent around in production throughout North America. <clears throat> so again, just a little bit of the history. I won't read all of that through for you, but it's, it's been a fun adventure to be involved um, almost since the beginning. Our, our universities in Ontario, Canada, some of them have helped with the folks in the U.S. developing the standards and maintaining the standards and have been using them as well. So this history is uh, just a little bit of a fun trip down memory lane for us and, and uh, how EDI got rolling. Uh, and then this last bullet here, for those of you that haven't heard of PESC, is the Post-Secondary Electronic Standards Council. Um, so PESC became the de facto higher ed standards group uh, in the early 2000s. And both the EDI standards that I'm discussing and the XML that Jeff will talk about and some PDF standards um, are overseen by PESC. Uh, and they're PESC approved and they're free and open standards, which is another nice feature of these standards that you can, you can use and implement um, for a very low cost in some areas. And then there's some software that'll be involved that I'll talk about for EDI specifically. So what is an EDI formatted file? So essentially it's, it's a text file and it's an export from your system, whether you're still on a mainframe system, whether it's a, a small database that's running on a, on a desktop machine or anywhere in between, it's just a text file that's extracted from your database of a student record system uh, and it's the, a delimited file, like a CSV. So if, if you're used to sharing CSV, or if you look behind the scenes of an Excel file or tab delimited files, it really is very much like that, where you have data that's separated by certain characters to know where this, each piece of data starts and stops. Um, each line of data in the file is named as a segment, and that gives context around what information is being represented on that line of information, whether it's something about the student or about their, the ID numbers to identify them, who the sender was, which course is being talked about. And each of those segments and pieces of data can, uh, there's a mixture of optional and required fields and segments. Some things are required to make sure that we have at least some keys that can be passed around between the computer systems to know what uh, record is being exchanged. Uh, and then there are a lot of optional fields because sometimes there are requirements that are only relevant to certain, maybe there's a, a statewide um, test, for example, that needs to be shared within your state but other states that you send to or Canadian provinces may not need that data. So those are often optional um, so that you, don't, you can or don't have to include them if it's not relevant for you. Um, these se segments and fields also can occur multiple times. Um, every course on a transcript has its own line and we'll see an example of that shortly. They can be nested within each other. So for example, courses can be sent within semesters. So you can provide a hierarchy of data and the context for the data that's being processed. And then as a receiver, that's very helpful to keep the context when you're trying to load that into your admission system uh, or match it up to other requirements for the student um, and checking any kind of prerequisites and doing calculations on GPAs and various types of GPAs, for example. So here's an example, a snippet of what a file would look like. So this line one SES is that um, line um, descriptor that I talked about. So this is to do with the session. So everything on that line from SES through to that first semicolon is something to do with a session and it's happened to be the fall 2005 session. Repeating after that, you can send summary information where you can include things like GPAs around the course. Each CRS line is one course on the transcript and those can repeat however many times for each course that the student has. And all the relevant information about a course is on that line and a couple of related lines. And you'll see that the limiter, in this instance, it's the vertical bar that separates pieces of information. That character is something you can configure uh, the important thing is just to choose something that's not actually sent in your data 
because that can cause some parsing problems. Um, but some folks will use the vertical bar, some might use an asterisk or a dollar sign, whatever makes sense, and the software knows how to interpret that and use it to parse out the data properly. Um, the name segment, you'll see that every segment along here, piece of data, these are like kind of like a, a row label in an Excel spreadsheet, essentially, that tells you what each line is about. Um, you'll see here that there are several uh, vertical pipes down in the, in case you can't see my cursor moving, sorry. On the very last line of data, this last CRS, partway over you'll see there are a number of vertical bars right beside each other with nothing in between them. Those represent some of those optional fields that I mentioned. So if you have optional fields, you just close that field off with another, with another delimiter character and go on to the next field until you're done sending the data. And at the end of each line, this file is using a semicolon as a terminator. And then those characters again tell the software how to parse out the actual data content that you're sharing with your partner. So some of the, cons the um, institutional considerations around EDI, but some of these apply to PDF and XML formats as well. And again, as Matt mentioned, we really want to try to emphasize for everyone attending about business continuity opportunities here, thinking about things that you've learned during the pandemic and getting away from paper processing. What advantages can you have by going to either PDF to start with or going into a full data exchange or a mixture of both? You may have reason to do PDFs, for example, going out into workforce and exchange data files between institutions, for example. Um, and so this slide talks a bit about what capabilities might you already have. Um, your IT resources that you might have available today might have some training in some of the technologies we're talking about. Um, your SIS may come prepackaged with some of the functionality already available. It might just need configuring. So depending on which SIS, if you have an ERP system, um, it may have some of the functionality there for you that just needs to be turned on, configured, and tested. Um, also to help you make a decision in moving into a, a data exchange um, methodology, the cost benefit analysis, and Matt touched on some of the cost reductions with the PDF spring right away. Um, one of our slides at the end with resources today will have a link to the Acro Speedy page. And on our website, we do have a cost calculator that you can use to do some cost benefit analysis, looking at what it costs you today um, for staff time and resources and so on for paper transcripts and where you might have some cost savings uh, going into either a PDF or data exchange um, mechanism. Those can be in-house solutions or vendor-sponsored solution. As I mentioned, your SIS may have parts of this for you. Maybe your degree audit system may have some functionality for importing data files and actually automating some of the import and processing of the data. Um, you can automate as much or as little of the process as you would like to. Um, some folks will start with an initial exchange just to get the data files flowing between themselves and another partner and then add layers of automation over time as you get more comfortable with the data, more comfortable with the flow, um, and adding in things like automated error checking, uh, automated GPA calculations, and really working on those efficiency gains and process re-engineering for your business processes, and then be able to redeploy the staff that are currently, as Matt mentioned, doing the data entry and doing the paper handling process, redeploying those potentially into other tasks that actually need humans to intervene or helping with student service and other areas. So then you're gaining efficiencies in the processing of your transcripts and decreasing the time it takes as well as hopefully increasing student service in, in other fronts. Uh, that can also be a strategic goal as you look to work up with alumni relations, uh, other student service areas, uh, and a strategic um, sort of view that you can have in your major trading partners is this what this last bullet is talking about, preferred trading partner methodologies. If you're trying to make a decision, which way do I go, PDF, EDI, or XML, uh, sometimes a decision can be around looking at your major feeder schools, either that you receive from or schools that you feed into, are they already doing some type of data or document exchange? And if they are, it might make sense right out of the gate to use the same format and then be able to have that trading base um, established right away, as well as testing partners, because testing each of these processes is very important, especially as you add layers of automation um, to be able to test things before you push the button and just let it start running behind the scenes. So some of the process considerations around the EDI format, uh, it is an older format, as I mentioned, first established in the early 90s. So it's been with us for several decades. It's a tried and true technology being used by hundreds of schools around North America. But sometimes the technical complexity that's required can limit some institutions, maybe depending on your IT capacity at your institution or other priority lists that you have or your system limitations. Uh, there is a need for some translation software or certain SIS compatibility to, re to recognize the full benefits, especially on the incoming side for admissions. Um, and that software, some people choose to write it. There are packages you can purchase. Your, your ERP vendor may have something that can be used 
um, to bolt on as well. So those are some considerations around the technical side of implementing. On the functional side, the data mapping exercise can be cumbersome. Uh, depending on the complexity of your transcript and the complexity of your system, uh, it's very important to have functional staff involved who know your data, uh, both from the record side when you're sending uh, and on the admission side when you're receiving to be able to map the data that you're going to send out in an EDI file and map the incoming data from other institutions. Uh, fortunately, one of the pieces on the incoming side is, as I mentioned, a lot of the standard fields are optional and you can choose as a receiver what's the most important to you. You don't have to use all the fields as a receiver. And as a sender, you don't either. You, you would typically send what you send on your paper transcript to represent it. Although some schools do choose to use some of the optional fields in addition, um, because it might be helpful for the recipients to have even more data than was allowed on a paper transcript. Sometimes for just, you ran out of real estate on a piece of paper to be able to send certain data, or there's newer data that hasn't been sent in the paper world. This can be an opportunity to open up some additional fields that can be really helpful for receivers to process with. And typically that data mapping exercise is a one-time exercise with periodic maintenance after the fact, um, as you change the data that you send or receive. Um, similar to bullet one, where I mentioned that because EDI is an older technology that's been around for a number of years, it can be perceived as complex by many um, of today's IT folks who maybe haven't been familiar with it or haven't had opportunity to use this type of system. Um, or there could just be other priorities and adding a system change like this into your priority list may take some back and forth with the resources that you'll need to have assigned. And that's where getting buy-in from your upper management or the folks who have decision-making power and can help you champion this on your campus um, can be very important. Similar to many of the benefits that Matt mentioned for PDF, uh, this slide talks around the EDI benefits. So uh, the, one of the key things is that there have been no cases of fraudulent electronic transcripts reported in North America ever since these have gone live in the early 90s. So the electronic transcript files are generated by the issuing institution. They're sent either directly to the receiving institution or sent through a trusted third party network. And it's, it's fraudulent proof to, in, in that way where there's added layers of security. You can have accounts with extra users and password. The data files can be encrypted uh, at rest as well as during transmission uh, and a number of other mechanisms that can be put in place. Uh, but there have been no reported uh, cases of fraudulent e-transcripts uh, through all these decades partly because the, the student's hands just never touch it. This EDI file goes directly from institution to institution. It's not being sent as a, um, a student copy or going out to any, anywhere that isn't part of the trusted exchange network. Um, the other nice benefit here, the first bullet is that the standards are consistent. So I mentioned earlier in the presentation that the electronic data exchange is like a standard language. Um, so our systems don't have to learn how to communicate with every other system that might send you data and you don't need to talk with different file formats and know the layout and context of each of those, but it's a standard language. So your system just needs to map into it to send and map out of it to receive. Uh, and it's that standard language that is very, very helpful and consistent. A number of resources are available um, that some of them are listed at the end of our presentation today that can help you understand the, uh, the process, as well as the ACRO Speedy Committee. Uh, one of our mandates is to be here to help the ACRA community with anything around electronic ex exchange that we can help you with. Um, so we all have experiences working at institutions and exchanging data for a number of years. Um, and if, if we're not sure of the answer, we also have many folks that we can reach out to. We have listservs to try and help get the answer for you um, to help your implementation and receive those, those great benefits. Um, I also mentioned testing a little bit earlier. So there are a lot of um, folks that are available in the community already doing EDI exchange who are happy to help with testing. Uh, and that can be an, an opportunity just to bounce ideas off of them for certain scenarios. What would you do, especially as you look to add automation, as well as actually practicing and, and using some test files to send and receive and just see how the process flows. That can be very, very helpful. And I'll turn it over to this point uh, to Jeff for, to talk about XML. Hi, I'm Jeff Elliott and um, as Mike introduced me earlier, I'm the Senior Manager for Enterprise Data Warehousing and Reporting um, for the University of Missouri system. Um, part of our charge is also data integrations, um, which is uh, how I came to learn about uh, uh, Speedy and Acro and um, uh, the various mechanisms for electronic data exchange um, that already have standards. Um, and I'll be talking about XML, also introducing uh, very briefly an emerging standard um, um, 
adding to um, the arsenal of tools that we have available. Um, uh, for those of you not familiar with XML, um, uh, XML uh, stands for Extensible Markup Language. Um, it's very, it, it's from the same um, genealogy as uh, HTML or Hypertext Markup Language, also known as the language of the internet. So pretty much any web page you look at is built upon the concept of HTML. Um, the difference is uh, XML is designed to carry data, not to display data. Um, we'll show you some examples. Um, XML is self-descriptive. Um, the XML standards that we define um, have, um, are associated with a schema, which includes um, additional information for um, machines to um, interpret, uh, including things like constraints, um, data types, content. Um, and as I mentioned, um, the uh, genealogy is um, from the same root as HTML, um, which was an effort in the 70s at IBM to create a standardized generalized markup language. Um, and it's vocabularies and ontologies that can be used for exchange of information between systems um, without necessarily the need for human intervention. Um, so uh, next slide there, Doug. So here's an example of XML. Um, the, excuse me. Um, this, this is a student record. Um, and as you can see, here's a student nested within that as a person, uh, various IDs, everything's labeled with a, a starting tag. Um, and slash the same tag name indicates that's the end of that particular piece of data. Um, you can see it's quite verbose. It's easy to read um, by a person, but also by a machine because there are rules. Um, for example, if we look at name, we see name nested within that. There's first name, middle name is blank, um, and last, last name. And then we close the name tag. So this whole block represents the name. Machines can very easily see that, but humans can very easily read it as well. So that, that and we'll touch on this a little bit later, helps with troubleshooting if something's wrong with a file. Um, so um, the, the next slide um, demonstrate, demonstrates from one of our implementation guides. Um, this is, um, uh, a more structured diagram of how the pieces uh, fit together. Again, if we look at that student section, we see the person, you see a little plus sign there. If you're um, looking in an interactive tool, you would see underneath the person or things like name and date of birth that we uh, showed on the previous slide. Um, but this is part of an implementation guide that is published with each of the standards um, to help you as you're um, implementing, but also um, developing partnerships um, with either other institutions or vendors uh, for sharing data using the XML standard. Um, uh, uh, next slide, Doug. Um, so um, some, some considerations when you're working with the XML. Um, the XML syntax is, itself is uh, very verbose, and because of that, it can uh, it, it leads to much larger um, file sizes than EDI. Uh, the advantage of that is it is easier for human read and, and, and for you to troubleshoot. Um, the disadvantage is um, because of that verbosity, uh, it it can lead to um, higher storage transmission. Um, and processing costs um, over, over time, of course, those costs um, have come down. Storage is cheaper now than it's ever been. Um, uh, transmission across the internet's uh, pretty much ubiquitous. Um, and um, as with EDI, um, XML transmissions require um, 
an acknowledgement. So when your machine receives um, an XML file, um, you need to acknowledge that you received it. Um, this is part of what Doug was talking about earlier. The technical term is non-repudiation, but basically it, it helps present, fr prevent fraud because if I receive um, an XML or an EDI document, I acknowledge that I've received it. Well, if the sender says, well, wait a minute, I didn't send you something that could be fraudulent, it, it would help you recognize that and reconcile that situation. But it also helps the sender say, okay, they've received it. I, I, I know they've received it um, as well. So it closes that loop on a 360 basis. Um, so um, next slide, some of the key benefits. Um, again, um, that content um, identification, you can, look at, you can look at the file and see, um, uh, see what's there, but every, every tag is processable um, by machines as well. Um, by using um, the schemas and the standards that are defined and maintained by uh, PESC, there's an enforced structure, um, there are enforced enumerations, Everybody's using the same values um, within that standard, and they're they're translating them. Um, you know, uh, depending upon if two schools are using different ERP systems, and they may have different tags and labels um, uh, for various um, concepts within their institution. Everybody maps to this common standard where the enumerations mean the same thing across the board. So a file created uh, for institution A is, is also interpretable for institution B, which uses a third ERP system. Um, um, XML and the PEST standards, they are an international standard. Um, uh, they are, they are um, uh, uh, recognized and used, uh, again, primarily in North America, but there are other um, uh, organizations that have either modeled upon or used um, those standards um, as well. Um, and by PESC as our standards body, we have industry standardization and XML is a ubiquitous international standard. So, uh, next slide. Um, one of the other advantages of XML um, over uh, EDI um, is this all, uh, XML supports Unicode. Um, and for those of you not familiar with Unicode, it's um, uh, encoding of data for computers, um, but it, it's a, it allows for a much larger data set than um, uh, the ANSI standard, which is um, eight bits of data. Unicode supports um, uh, 16 bits, and so you can um, expand it to um, include uh, foreign language uh, character sets, um, double byte character sets, um, and, and also mathematical character sets. Um, as I mentioned, it is verbose, um, but everything is labeled. Um, if you're looking at an EDI document, one of the downsides, you have to um, have a reference as far as when you're looking at a segment, what's in, in between each of the delimiters and you have to map those back and forth. XML clearly describes um, in English or near English um, what each of those tags and each of those elements contain. Um, um, EDI and XML are both uh, relatively platform independent. Um, so as, as technology changes, um, they're read the same on Mac, on Linux, and on Windows machines. Um, and the, the key is because you're transmitting data and not an image, um, you, you can reduce your data entry time. Um, and uh, something we haven't uh, touched on yet, improve data quality because you don't have a person at a keyboard um, 
you know, even if they only make one mistake out of every thousand characters, that's still one mistake every thousand characters. And in a day, if they're putting in 60 to 80,000 characters, it's a significant number of mistakes that could be entered during data entry. Um, and, and as the um, slide on PDF showed, um, there is no human processing time. So it's just a matter of how long does it take the machine to ingest it? Um, you can automate your articulation rules so that um, you, you do a one-time setup and um, data articulates as well once you have those rules in place. So, and one more slide of benefits. Um, there are um, within PESC, um, as um, changes to the standard are, are identified, we do update the standards. Um, but the beauty of it is, is the update to the standard um, in general, it's, um, we maintain backwards compatibility. If there's new data wanted, we don't change the meaning of an existing um, data element. We'll add a new data element um, compatible with uh, 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 many of your national reporting systems, iPads, uh, is, iPads and SIVAs, two good examples. Um, the Post-Secondary Electronic Standards Council, there's uh, standards for both high school and post-secondary transcripts. Um, so when you're working with your trading partners that are high schools, there, are, there, there is a high school transcript standard that's already in place. Um, and again, um, XML usage, XML and EDI um, uh, in North America, um, in Canada, they've, uh, been accelerated uh, adoption of the XML standard. Um, as um, Matt mentioned earlier with PDF, there is some um, uh, decrease in the adoption of EDI and XML right now um, uh, uh, due to the increased adoption of um, PDF. The good news there is there's less paper and more um, PDF, the electronic document, um, but there's still the data entry and the processing um, that has to occur that electronic data exchange um, uh, uh, helps eliminate. Um, and your major uh, student information system vendors um, do provide support. Uh, Banner, Jansbar, PeopleSoft, um, have built-in support for both inbound and outbound EDI and XML. Well, EDI and or XML, um, not all of them support both. Um, okay. Um, the emerging standard that I mentioned, um, uh, JSON, uh, short for job, JavaScript Object Notation. Um, this is emerging emerging standard. It's um, used in a lot of application programming interfaces. Uh, it's kind of a best of both worlds between EDI and uh, XML. Uh, again, it's a text format. Um, it involves name or key value pairs and data is represented in the hierarchy very similar to XML. Um, uh, an example um, of comparing um, uh, next slide, Doug, sorry. Um, example, JSON on the top. Um, there, you'll, you'll notice the difference between it and XML is the JSON does not use a closing tag. Um, it's slightly more uh, formatted in nature in that um, the name segment here is contained within two curly braces. Um, and then it has a hierarchy where first name and last name are a part of the name. Um, the, those are contained within curly braces to represent the inside of that segment. Um, and so um, your, file, your file size, your message size is gonna be smaller than XML. Um, it's still easily readable um, um, from a human perspective. Um, which helps with troubleshooting and with initial setup um, of your files. 
Um, but this, this is becoming the um, preferred mechanism um, within application programming environments, um, RESTful, a, uh, RESTful API, um, and, and I, I deal with JSON a lot in the realm of um, extracting data from cloud-based systems to build data warehouses or to build integrations between our student information system and um, a cloud-based product. Um, JSON is a preferred format that they're using now because it, it's closer to a programming language data structure that you would find within Java or uh, Python or many other programming languages. Okay. Um, next slide, Doug. So in 2017, PESC uh, launched a task force to um, uh, uh, develop um, JSON standards. Um, we determined to take a uh, multi-phase approach for this. Um, phase one, um, we, we defined a way of using the existing XML standards um, to um, create JSON documents. Um, that standard um, called XML compliant JSON uh, was released in March 2019. Um, but we didn't stop there. Um, uh, additional phases are underway. Um, and the current, current phase that's underway is um, looking at um, uh, ad additional uh, capacities within JSON and defining um, uh, the JSON uh, schema language, developing schemas very similar to what XML has that actually define the data types, the enumerations, the accepted values um, within a JSON message. Um, so next slide, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so um, as, as we're, uh, the XML compliant describes the rules and methods um, to create JSON that's validated against the existing XML schemas, as I said. Um, and there are many, uh, there are programming tools um, uh, that allow you to um, serialize JSON to XML and XML to JSON. Serializing means just reading it and translating it um, into the other structure. And, and as I said, this was approved as a standard March 2019. Um, next slide. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, we're continuing to, to develop JSON um, and JSON-LD native standards. JSON-LD uh, stands for JSON for linked data, uh, which improves the interoperability of JSON documents across standards. Um, the current work of the JSON-LD task force is available at the link provided there. Um, but JSON linked data allows you to take advantage of uh, to literally embed other standards, um, for example, federal information processing standards for um, uh, geography, uh, countries, states, counties, other ge geographic breakdowns um, as a part of your standard without actually requiring you to go back in and copy that standard into your standards document. It, it actually um, expands it into your standard automatically, I guess you would say. Um, and, and we continue to go forward. We will, um, uh, with, with the JSON, um, also be developing JSON schemas um, to operate in parallel with the XML schemas so that we have a full full standard of JSON and XML that are compliant. And as we get requests to update standards, we'll be updating both of those. Um, and we've already talked about several of these um, uh, bullet points, um, the advantages uh, of electronic data exchange versus paper or paper image um, uh, PDF. Um, and most of it has to do with its machine to machine um, and a, 
person or people are not involved in the actual processing and loading of that data. Um, so um, as students have become more, more mobile, they've expected that their transcripts and their student record data um, be more mobile as well. E EDX can facilitate that. Um, uh, credit and credential transferability. Um, uh, uh, reverse transfer is a good example of that. Um, and, and the identification with the EDI and XML of uh, how to manage reverse transfer transcripts. Um, removing barriers to student access. Uh, uh, um, again, push a button, send data, consume data, articulate. Um, and then as we've been stressing um, business continuity, if there's no paper involved um, and you can process automatically, you can interact with your uh, student information system um, and re review any articulation failures or any transfer failures. But the only thing you have to work, work on are those things that you haven't coded or you haven't, you know, you haven't defined a transfer rule before. Um, or if, if there's an error, you work with your um, sender to address that um, and, and um, fix the file. Um, Doug, Matt, anything you want to add from this slide? Because um, no, thank, thank you're you. on mute, Matt. Sorry, we're, we're running out of time here. Um, I know the, the majority of the remaining slides are about resources and where you can look to get information. Um, but we probably want to address the questions in the chat. Uh, Q&A right now. Yes, I think that's a good idea, Matt, too. And, and I know that uh, the um, in the chat panel, Aneta from Acro earlier on in the presentation gave you the link to download these slides from today. And so the resources, as Matt mentioned, on the following slides are the last five or six of our slides here. They have a, a number of links to other websites and some Acro publications. And you can outreach to any of us or the whole Speedy Committee. Our emails are provided for you. Um, so I think that's a good idea. If you download the PDFs, and please do follow up with us with any questions, and we'll take your questions now from today. And also just a quick reminder about next week's part two of this um, webinar, where you can come back and have a roundtable discussion with the SPEED committee. Thanks, everybody. So yeah, I'll try to go through these briefly. And some of the presenters did indicate they can stay on a bit later, but we'll try to be sensitive to time. Uh, so the the first two uh, have to do with vendors within the electronic exchange space. Um, so I'll kind of combine them, but what are the, the two main competitors for electronic delivery of PDF? Um, and then uh, as a kind of follow up to that is if, if you and the speedy committee have any information about um, which one maybe is more popular with institutions and, and potentially why, uh, if you can briefly expound upon that anyway. Sure. So, um, so, uh, so I'll go on this one. Um, most of us are linked to a vendor. Uh, Parchment and the National Student Clearinghouse are the true two prevailing vendors in the space. There used to be um, four or five uh, in this space, but they have consolidated. Um, and so I, I think um, it, it's fair to say that uh, we would not recommend one vendor over another. Uh, each of them have their strengths. Um, uh, the, you know, the, the pricing model is, you know, is really what you're looking for when you're considering a vendor. Uh, some have minimum um, transactions required to get certain pricing, uh, but they're all willing to work with you and provide this service. Absolutely. Perfect. Um, and then uh, Zira asked, do you have a list of the international institutions that use this type of electronic transfer of transcripts? And I don't know if necessarily would have a list, but maybe uh, some kind of resource that might um, point the point her in the right direction. I can take part of that one. I know being from Canada, I, I've worked um, with the with my American colleagues here on the Speedy Committee, and over the years we have tried to maintain a bit of a list. Sometimes it's anecdotal information. Sometimes it's specific to um, schools we know that are working through various networks, either Parchment or the Clearinghouse or others, as Matt mentioned. Uh, and on our Speedy page, I believe we still have a link to a document that might be a little bit dated at the moment, but it does try to list by state within the US and by province within Canada and some other international where we know them. Uh, for example, Australia, New Zealand have brought up a PDF exchange within the past three years, and they're now moving towards using the same PESC XML standard that Jeff was describing. 
So that kind of information we can try and keep updated. But I believe the sort of a big picture, at least of Canada and US, is on our Speedy site, which is referenced towards one of the ending slides of our presentation today. Great. And then as sort of a follow-up to that, we have a question from Gloria asking which countries have you seen so far using XML for their academic records? Um, and then sort of related is with your list of international institutions, I guess. It, maybe that list might be helpful for her as well. Yes. Yeah, very good question. Through the, the PESC.org website, there'll be some more information around that as well for you because the PESC XML has typically been used within North America. It started in, in North America. And there, as I mentioned, it is uh, branching out to some of the schools in Australia and New Zealand that are looking to use the same PESC XML that we're using here in North America. But there are some other XML uh, uses around the world, sometimes using a slightly different standard, so a different structure, different names of tags. Uh, for example, MREX is a group of about nine or 10 countries in the EU. And those countries are exchanging with each other in their flavor of XML. Um, and there are some translations that PESC has worked on between the MREX standard and the PESC standard. So there's some interoperability that's possible there if you happen to have exchange agreements with some of those countries, for example, Norway or uh, some of the, the um, some other countries in the EU could be helpful there. And th that will continue to grow as well. Great. And then I'll try to uh, get through the, well, I don't know if it's possible with these last two. I guess we'll play it based on this first one. Um, are there resources to assist schools with implementing OCR to extract data from PDF or for mapping EDI into the SIS? Um, and see, so want to say this is for situations where transfer credit articulations already exist in the human review, input is redundant. So there are there are vendors out there that provide that technology to uh, take a take a paper transcript as an example that you image and then it screen scrapes that information. There are a couple of folks on the Speedy Committee who are really proficient at that. Um, and so uh, if if the requester wants more information about what we are currently doing uh, as a Speedy Committee using this technology, we're happy to share our you know our successes and our challenges. Uh, but largely, this is a, a vendor provided solution. Great. And then uh, last one, uh, as, as we move towards cloud-based uh, student information systems, are there implications to consider regarding any of the three options that you guys went through? I guess technically four. Um, and I'll, I'll start on this one, I guess. Um, there are implications um, and uh, many of um, those vendors um, are also members of PESC and participate. Um, in the uh, uh, standards review and development. Um, and so, at, but I would, if, I, I would strongly encourage you as you're talking to those vendors, ask them, um, you know, what electronic standards they support, how do they support them? Um, you know, uh, I, I've heard, uh, I'll say discussion, I don't, I haven't seen evidence that it's been built in yet, but um, OCR consumption of PDFs being built into those uh, cloud-based SISs. Um, there, there's a lot of things that um, we have conveyed to some of those vendors either um, uh, through PESC and Speedy or through our own institutions as we're trying to answer those questions. Um, and so I do believe all the vendors are looking at that being part and parcel to um, their system, but you want to talk to them about which of the standards are they supporting? Are they supporting EDI and XML, just EDI, just XML? Are they moving towards JSON or are they going to support all of them? And which one, which one works best for you or your trading partners? Or are you able to, if they support multiple versions, can you increase your number, you know, increase the electronic data from your trading partners? I think that's ultimately the goal is get people, people in pictures out of the process and let's work with the data. Sorry, my, my daughter wants me to get going here. Uh, but we are, we are finished with, uh, with the questions there. So I just wanted to thank uh, you, Jeff, Doug, Matt, uh, for sharing your expertise and knowledge in this area. I know it was helpful for everybody that attended. 
Um, and I want to thank everybody else that took time out of their day and stayed with us a little bit late just to see those answers. Uh, just as a reminder, we do have a follow-up to this session next Wednesday, um, or yeah, it's next Wednesday, uh, for a kind of a Q&A, so it'll be a little more interactive if you have more specific questions or just kind of follow-ups that you got from this one. So we encourage you to register and attend for that one as well. Um, we'll have our panelists back for that, and uh, we appreciate that. And uh, otherwise, have a good day. Enjoy the rest of your weeks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye for now.